We have so much more going on with this next panel, and then another short panel, and then at 11.30, out to the hall to see the Kanawha County students, and we'll talk more about that. But right now, we have a very important panel, and if you were here last night and heard the conversation, you realized the issues at hand with teacher preparation. And this session is called Reimagining Teacher Preparation. And a lot of conversation last night and even today about the teacher shortage, but the decline in enrollment in teacher prep colleges, and what do we do about that? And I know when, when I work with the state board, with Scott and Gail and Lloyd and Wade and others, that that was a, something that was on our mind. How do you pivot to meet the, this decline in enrollment and still keep you know, it's your, your powerful program. So we're gonna talk a lot about that. But I'd like to introduce our wonderful moderator, Dr. Jaime Taylor, who's the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Marshall University. And we're lucky to say he's also a member of our WVPEC board. And since he came to West Virginia, I think this is the second year, right? He has really made an impact and I know last year at the Legislative Forum, he was very instrumental in talking us through some of the things with the Free Community College Last Dollar In. He had experience in his previous um, work in Tennessee with that. But it's interesting because he told me when I asked him about moderating this teacher education panel, he said, you know, I'm, I'm in physics. I am, that's my background, I'm in physics. He said, I'm kind of out of my element, but I, I'd love to try to do it. And he's already done a great job organizing and will do a good job. But it's really exciting that he has such a wide variety of experience and expertise in the physics and all throughout STEM. And now we have him fully engaged in teacher education. So, thank you, Heim. Thank you very much, Donna. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce the uh, uh, panelists. Uh, then I'll give a few brief remarks, and then I'm going to go back to them and let them uh, kind of give a couple of brief remarks. Uh, so I'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Ryan Saunders, uh, Policy Advisor, uh, Learning Policy Institute. Uh, Dr. L Stephanie Lorenz, Coordinator for Teacher Education, West Virginia University. Uh, Dr. Um, S Jennifer Penland. Director of the School of Education, Shepherd University, and Dr. Teresa Eagle, Dean of the College of Education and Professional Development, Marshall University. Uh, and so as Donna said, uh, my background um, is uh, as a chair of a physics department for many years and a dean of a college of science and mathematics. Uh, so in a moment, I'll give some experience, uh, background on my experiences with uh, teacher preparation. Uh, I'm gonna start by giving some, uh, talking about a little bit of data that Mr. Saunders provided. Um, from the uh, Learning Policy Institute. So a major concern with regards to the supply of quality teachers is the recent decline in teacher education enrollments. Nationally, teacher preparation enrollment has declined by 38% since 2009. So that's 38% nationally. In West Virginia, the decline in teacher preparation enrollment is outpacing the national average and is down 48% since 2008. Across the country, states are struggling with teacher shortages in specific subject areas, across geographic locations, uh, and the impact of these shortages are felt predominantly by students of color and students in low income. Uh, so what can be done about this? Uh, again, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my uh, limited background. Uh, when I was a chair of the physics department, uh, we uh, in Tennessee were producing one uh, physics teacher per year for the whole, the whole state of Tennessee, and that was on average. Uh, where I was at, you know, I actually remember pushing, so it's particularly at the high school level, I would try to get people in, in, interested in, in uh, teaching physics. Finally, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be real clever. There was this new pathway, it was called an alternate teacher licensure. So if somebody made it through the physics program or made it through mathematics and had the content, which everybody's like, oh, you gotta have the content, that's the important part, uh, then you can go out and become a teacher and get your teacher certification after the fact. And so you can get work on a master's degree. And so I thought that was the solution. I said, this is gonna be great, you know. And actually, I was able to encourage a lot of the students to do this, uh, because, you know, we, we talk about it and talk about the impact they would have on, on, on lives. Uh, about one in five of those individuals made it past one year. 
you know, what happened is they got into the classroom and it just, they didn't have the skill set to manage the classroom. Uh, There's all those other skills that come along with that. And so through that painful experience, I recognized how important teacher preparation uh, was. The next uh, uh, attempt that uh, myself and some individuals at Middle Tennessee State University made at this was much more successful. Um, at Middle Tennessee State University, they decided to focus in on physics uh, teacher preparation. And so uh, in Tennessee, we, we did a lot of conversations, as Brian Nolan has said, finding everybody's mission. And where I was at, we focused on, on mathematics teacher preparation. And so what they did is they went after it uh, almost as a department, said this is what we're going to become good at. We're going to let people understand this is important. Uh, as some of the panelists will talk about in a minute, the prestige associated with it. Uh, they had, went, went from about five or six physics majors to 100, the vast majority of those being for teacher preparation. And they're putting out about 10 to 12 teachers per year. Pretty much enough for, well, it's a whole lot better than the one per year we were doing earlier. Uh, maybe it's still not enough. What we did is we went after the math teachers. And we did a little bit different approach. Uh, we w were given a $10 million gift. Uh, so we were able to actually pay uh, the way for somebody that was willing to do this. And we did two emphasis. We focused on high school in individuals coming in, but we also looked at current teachers in the system that might want to become a math teacher. Uh, we put the courses online so they could take the majority of it online, and then we had a two-week intensive program in the summer that we paid for if they would come in and, and do those two weeks. And so we were putting out about 20 of what I would consider high, highly qualified math teachers that had already been in the classroom, knew they wanted to be there, so there was no retention issue, uh, and then we we're putting them back out as math teachers. Uh, so that's my limited experience with this, uh, but it seemed like in that, that, that little window that was working. So now I want to uh, go back to, uh, I'm going to start with Dr. Penland and ask her if she'll give some brief opening uh, statement with an overview of the Shepherd University's teacher preparation program. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Uh, can you hear me? Has it picked up my voice? That's what I was told. Let it pick your voice up. Um, <laughs> um, I am the director of the School of Education at Shepherd University. Um, I have had um, a year and a half to jump in, get on the boat, and make sure it didn't uh, throw the faculty off. Okay, that was my challenge. Uh, I integrated uh, Policy 5100 recently with some of the things that I feel are most complicated, but also, in a way, very opportunist, okay? Our students in the PED program, we have about 39 currently in the student teaching. We have opted for the uh, pilot in the four year, and we're moving forward to doing some wonderful things. Um, I see some challenges for us with a 5100. And so I feel like as a director, uh, moving forward in our program, we need to have opportunities for, to be valued as a teacher. Last night's panel, I really appreciated that, the gentleman that said that, to be valued as a profession. That's number one. We are a profession that has created this room. Think about that, okay? And the second thing is, to support funding for that, for that year-long pilot that is a little tricky. And I want it to be an option. I don't want it to be required, not yet. I want it to be an option. And those are the two things that I see us moving forward with and doing some in interesting things for these students. We have uh, probably the best PED program I've ever seen. I've worked across several states, Colorado, Wyoming, Texas, uh, North Dakota, and Shepherd before. And I think we have the best field, 326 plus hours, and we're moving to 500 before they graduate as a bachelor's. So what is an expert? 10,000 hours or more. Thank you. All right, uh, next will be uh, Dr. Lorenz, uh, give a brief opening statement. Uh, with an overview of West Virginia University's teacher preparation program. Good morning. Try to do the same thing here. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm happy to be here. I was a Harrison County teacher for eight years before I stepped into my role at WVU. I've been here for 10 years. I was hired as a clinical faculty member and I've been coordinating teacher education just since May. So I'm fresh to it and really trying to create and um, 
nurture one community of teacher education across WVU because we have so many programs that are sitting in different colleges. So one thing we're trying to work on is how can we work together um, even uh, more efficiently and to strengthen the relationships across our stakeholders within the institution. So um, just kind of three main pieces that I wanted to mention in the opening statements would be how we're rolling out the residency and co-teaching initiative pilot. We have about 10 students right now piloting that currently in Harrison and Monongalia counties. And so far, it has been hugely successful. I, I echo uh, Jennifer here in saying that um, it has wonderful outcomes, but I do um, hope that it remains an option, not a requirement, because it's not a one-size-fits-all for everyone. I will say also that um, we have seen an organic shift in some of our students that are starting in a classroom with a teacher saying, can I stay with these, this teacher for next semester? So it's it's not an initial residency, but it kind of turns out to be because they yearn for that year-long um, relationship with the students and teachers. So that there are some really positive things happening um, in North Central West Virginia around the residency. We did a strong co-teaching component with it and also aligning um, the Danielson framework for teaching, dealing with evidence-based feedback and, and really strong components of that. Another piece that we are working on right now is with our school counseling program. We're creating a one or two hour course. This is in its infancy stage, but it is all centered on social emotional learning, uh, working with students in trauma, and that is going to be a cross university course that will service whether you're PK through 12, and it will actually also co-exist um, with school counselors. So it's fostering those collaborative relationships early and understanding roles of uh, one another and how we can support each other. And the third thing I would say that we're really working on is expanding our boundaries within um, professional preparation and clinical experiences. So uh, just in the past year, the influx of calls we get from school districts asks, asking for, do you have a te could you have, can we do a teacher in residence in this area. We have counselors in residence next semester in Preston and Harrison counties. So that is happening a lot. And it's if it's done well, it can support retention across the state in different areas. Across, For example, this semester we have them in Pendleton, Pendleton County, we have them in Harrison County, we have them across the state. And so um, one thing we're doing is exploring technology support so that we're not just bound geographically to North Central West Virginia, but if we have these folks who are from, for example, the southern part of the state that want to teach in the southern part of the state, if there are openings and we can get them out there early if they're ready, we're trying to support that as well. Thank you, Dr. Lorenz. Uh, Dr. Eagle will give a brief opening statement with a description of Marshall University's recent work in, uh, on improving teacher preparation program. Good morning, thank you. When we talk about teacher preparation, we talk about a, a very complex and ever-changing um, atmosphere. And the fact that you have three folks here from three different institutions in the state makes it even more interesting to see that we're all facing the same challenges, we all have the same problems, and we're all attempting to make sense of and make policies work for the best for our students in the state of West Virginia. When we talk about the problems that we're talk dealing with, recruitment, of course, as the folks have mentioned already, is very important. And recruitment is something that we haven't always focused on because we've always said, okay, we'll build it and they'll come. You know, we've got the teacher prep program and people are gonna come because they wanna be teachers. But unfortunately, that doesn't uh, fit in with what we're seeing now with the large number of people who are leaving or moving away from looking at teaching. It always hurts me when I hear a parent say, I'm a teacher and there's no way my kids are going to go into teaching because that says right up front that they don't even see it as a viable um, place to, to spend their time and to spend their efforts. And I think one of the critical pieces, as Jennifer mentioned, I think to begin with, is the fact that respect for the profession is probably the most important thing that we need to work on at this point. Because when I go out and try to recruit students, if they don't respect it and don't think it's something that's that something's worth their time, then I'm not going to even get their attention because they're going to move the other direction. And so frequently when I work with students in the MAT program where students have had, um, say, a physics degree or a, a math degree and they're coming back to get their teaching, it's because they say, well, I didn't do it 
teaching to begin with because my parents didn't want me to do that or because I didn't think it was good or because I listened to the people that said I wouldn't make any money. And now their hearts are coming back around and saying, yeah, I really should have done this the first time. So thank goodness we have those, those routes that people can come back because we do have the things like the post back certificate and the Master of Arts in Teaching, which we emphasize a great deal, but also with the alternative certification programs that we're dealing with. Marshall uh, has provided the modules for many of our, our um, folks who have gone the alternative certification route. We're involved with several counties providing that, and that's very important. One of the things I think, though, that is missing in that that we need to address even further and Jaime alluded to this, is that when you put someone out there who has the content, that's great because you have to have the content or you can't answer the questions. But if you don't have the pedagogy and the knowledge of how to teach and how to reach those children, then it doesn't matter that you're incredibly intelligent and that you won a math prize or whatever. So one of the things that we've been looking at is the idea of providing a different route for increasing the pedagogical knowledge for folks who are out there and need that. Um, when we talk about retention, we're also we're talking about retention when students come to us as students in the teacher education program. And retention in teacher prep programs are often uh, damaged incredibly by the student's ability to pass the praxis, the dreaded praxis tests. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're doing at Marshall as well is putting an effort out toward more praxis uh, support for students who are having to deal with that. If you've ever looked at the praxis tests and how expensive they are, you'll know that we're talking $100, $200, $300 per test. And we've had students that have taken those tests three, four, five, six times. And it's, it's sad, it's a shame, and they should be able to pass them. And we're not even talking necessarily about the content that they're getting in college, we're talking about basic reading, writing, and math abilities. So we've decided that that's one of our goals for this coming year. And during a remodel of the building, we've even established a room that is the Praxis Prep Room. So we will have multiple materials, people that are there as resources to help and answer questions. Teacher prep, though, does not end with graduation and licensure because no matter how good a student you were during your bachelor's and getting your teacher license, things change on a daily basis. They change periodically. You did a different group of students. There are different things to learn. There's so many things that need to be learned over the course of the time. And in my two or three years in teacher preparation, we won't talk about how long, so many cycles. Their new problems or their problems that come back around for a second time, things that um, people just need a refresher on. So one of the other things that we're looking at very closely is the concept of micro-credentialing. This is not a situation in which people have to come back to school and get another degree to get a certificate. It might be paired with that or it might be paired with new licensure or whatever, but it doesn't have to be. And what we're trying to look at are the kinds of, of tasks, the kinds of skills that we can put into a small two or three module experience that would be easily accessible, relatively inexpensive, and something that they could put then on their um, Vita or their CVs so that when they go to apply for a job and someone says, well, we really are working in a great deal with these teacher residency programs, how much experience have you had with co-teaching? And they can say, oh, look, I have a micro-credential in co-teaching from Marshall University. And so that's one of the big things that we're looking at in terms of revisioning teacher preparation is extending it beyond that initial part, but also making it available and um, just beneficial and valuable to our teachers in the field. Because it's not just preparing them and getting them out there and making them good teachers, but it's keeping them good teachers and helping them to grow to be even better. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Eagle. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Uh, Saunders will give a brief opening statement with a high-level nationwide overview of how other states have approached the issue of using teacher preparation programs to help teachers utilize student data to personalize learning. Good morning. Uh, from the Learning Policy Institute, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization that advances evidence-based policies to support empowering and equitable education for every child. 
I want to thank our hosts today, the West Virginia Public Education Collaborative and the Hunt Institute for inviting us into this space and for your interest in teacher preparation. Our president and CEO, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, is fond of saying, teaching is the profession upon which all other professions depend. And so your interest in how those teachers are prepared is fundamental to the success of that work moving forward. Um, we are currently engaged in a research project with the Council of Chief State School Officers and the West Virginia Department of Education amongst five other states, uh, looking at teacher preparation policy and certification policy and how they support the social, emotional, and academic development of all students and access to that learning for all students in a state. As we've clearly heard, the issue of teacher retention and teacher recruitment is fundamental to the access to that learning for students in West Virginia and across the country. And so our goal is to look at policies and see where we can improve the effectiveness and efficiency of those policies to support access to that learning. So I'm gonna try, based off the feedback from the gentleman over here, to give you explicit steps the legislature can take in West Virginia to support the work of these great institutions on stage with me and the great institutions across this state doing the hard work of preparing the next generation of teachers. Specifically, I wanna think about how the systems you all have set up can be refined both from the start of recruiting an individual into preparation all the way through when they're a master teacher supporting the next generation of teachers in their schools, because that work is important as well. First, thinking about the shift to the year-long residency, the clinical partnerships that are gonna support those year-long residencies between K-12 counties in your state and the preparation programs, those partnerships take work, energy, and resources, whether they are residencies, whether they are the lab schools we heard about last night from East Tennessee State, or the professional development schools that were funded by the Benenham Foundation recently. Those types of schools don't just happen. Those partnerships don't happen. It takes a lot of coordination, a lot of planning, and a lot of work. And there are opportunities in the legislators support that work moving forward. States like Pennsylvania, states like Texas, states like California have offered grants to support that learning for those preparation programs in those districts and to fund incentives for candidates going through those programs. It is not easy to become a teacher and also try to maintain a job if you're a career changer or someone trying to pursue teaching. So incentives and financial support for candidates going through that year-long residency ensures you value their learning as a teacher, ensures they get through that program, and has also been shown that they will be retained long-term. Further, when thinking about the other opportunities, you all have made some great moves to expand the Underwood Smith Teacher Scholarship Program. And we heard about the Marshall Program, that's a you know, specific institution taking even additional steps to recruit math and science teachers. If you know where your shortages are, if you know the challenges in staffing geographic locations, I know this is a state with many rural school districts that may struggle to staff positions, that Underwood Smith Scholarship is a great opportunity, modeled its scholarships like North Carolina's Teaching Fellows Scholarship that supports incentives for candidates to recruit and enter the profession, but also provides them additional supports, opportunities to learn to become leaders in your state, and that kind of work is fundamental. And so there are opportunities to expand scholarships like that so that they're reaching more than just 20 individuals each year. In addition, North Carolina has a Principal Fellows Program. So we've heard about how fundamental leadership is to the success of our teachers, and we know there are efforts to improve leadership, but why not also create incentives to get more people into quality preparation for leaders so that they are gaining the skills to lead schools that support the social, emotional, and academic development of our students. As again, we've heard from districts and counties across the state, that's important moving forward. That's gonna be the hard work of teaching. And finally, this point was made, induction and early career mentoring for your new teachers is the key to ensure the investments you made when they entered preparation are not lost. Individuals who receive comprehensive early career mentoring and supports are twice as likely to stay in the profession, full stop. So removing the research-based elements of what that support looks like and pulling back from those kind of supports is not going to help you retain teachers. A state like Iowa has a program that ensures local control. Districts have the authority to set up the decisions about how those programs are gonna function, 
but they still set a bar for what research has shown is going to keep teachers in the profession. So those are steps the legislature can take to support the work of your counties, your hardworking superintendents who are trying to do the best they can with what they've got by allowing them to see what matters when they're trying to prepare and support the new teachers coming from these wonderful preparation programs. I will stop there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Saunders. Uh, next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, ask a question of each one of the panelists, uh, each panelist an opportunity to uh, respond. But in between that, what I'd like to do is uh, instead of waiting until the very end, if anybody has any specific questions about, about that or want, want to go further, uh, if they'll raise their hand. Uh, that's been a concern of mine for, for a number of years. Uh, been wrestling with it. The question is, what do we do to get te the teaching profession the respect that it deserves? It's interesting. Anytime you talk about respect, you hear respect is not given, respect is earned. I think the teaching profession earned respect many years ago, and they are not getting the respect that they earn. So what do we do to get it? Well, I wish I had a really good answer for that, because if I did, I'd write a book and, um, you know, go on with my life. Uh, I think part of the issue in terms of that respect is simply the way that we talk about teaching. And I think people in a leadership position, which you all are, uh, can make a great strides toward that in terms of talking about how you value teaching and what you think education is. Because it's not just the teaching, it's the education itself. Because one of the problems that I see in West Virginia, as well in a number of other states where I've lived and worked, is that if, if education isn't important to you to begin with, then teachers aren't important, then teachers aren't valuable, and that it really doesn't make any difference whether you go to school or not. It just matters that it's against the law for you to stay home. It, it, you know, you've got to have something in there that means that it's important. And at Marshall, we tend to have tons and tons and tons of our students who are the first in their families to go to college. And we kind of pride ourselves in that because that's a big accomplishment to get somebody out of a family that doesn't have the built-in value for education to at least make that effort to get somebody out there to go a little bit further. So I think simply the way that we speak about it, the way that we represent it, I was you know, there's so many comments that can be made in different directions about the recent teacher strikes. But I think one of the things that I valued about it was I saw a great cohesion in terms of, of people that were working together and I heard people talking about how respect, how much respect they gave the teachers for standing up for what they felt was important and so forth. And whether you agree with what they did or said or not, that wasn't the point. It was the fact that they stood up. And so again, I think the way that we treat them is very important, but I hate to say this, everything goes back to resources. And if we want to have quality people involved in things, we have to put our resources in those places. That doesn't mean we have to create new money, but it may means we, mean we need to reallocate money to some extent. We were just talking about the residency programs and, and incentives for those. Um, I have some wonderful people that serve as cooperating teachers for my student teachers. I love them, they're great, but we wear them out and we wear them out and barely say thank you. And of course, I do as much as I can, but even I'm not allowed to use state funding to do certain things for them to show appreciation. So, you know, we're back in that circle before. It's like, I appreciate you, I can give you a pat on the back, I can run you a certificate off on the machine, but when it comes down to it, I, I can't even give you a $50 present. So. We, we can't really say thank you in as many ways as we really should be able to. So I think the, the fact that we talk about them with a great deal of respect, that we talk about them in terms of understanding how difficult the job is. And if you've ever seen a person walk into a classroom who has never been a teacher and try to take care of that classroom for a day, it's funny. It's funny because they, you see the enlightenment coming on their faces. It's like, I thought this was a piece of cake, uh, and, and it isn't. It's a hard job. And I think just recognizing that people do a good job with those kinds of things is very important. And if, if I could, um, there's also messages we send and the routes we create for people in the profession. 
we don't let doctors start surgery before they've learned to become doctors. And we ensure that lawyers have training to become lawyers, and we set that bar. So by saying that someone can walk in from a profession and immediately start teaching, what are we saying about teaching as a profession? So those are things we have to keep in mind about the way we set up our preparation policies, is that they send a message about the value we place and the investment we want to make in our schools and our children. I'll, I'll echo quickly off that. I agree completely about the deprofessionalization and need to continue professionalizing. But the other thing I would say is, echoing off of Dr. Eagle, um, we don't celebrate enough. Um, so there are teachers out there doing amazing things um, that need to be celebrated more, whether that's in a media realm, um, just shouting and sharing information is, is really important, and that doesn't cost anything most often. So um, not just saying what our schools and looking at it as a deficit perspective, but also what are they doing that's really amazing and just shouting that out. I will also concur a little bit uh, with Teresa, Stephanie, and Ryan. Um, to be valued as a teacher and educator, I'm a STEM person as well. And uh, I think it's the most rewarding, the most difficult journey we have. Uh, I do value education and I try to role model. I think we forget role modeling is the greatest teacher. Everything that we do revolves around show me. And I know that the uh, national employers uh, current research on 2017-2018 uh, state we want highly educated, trainable communicators. It doesn't matter if you have a terminal degree anymore. It really doesn't. Show me what you can do. This is the value of an educator. Show me. This is why I think our PED programs with 326 hours before you graduate with a bachelor's. Now the policy 5100 is encouraging that to 500. Think about that. 500 hours before you graduate to show me that you're, you're an expert. You're moving toward an expert. So that is the passion. I have a little more passion than most people. Uh, I'm a visionary, and I feel like we can do anything we set ourselves to. So my question is this. What can you do with a college education in today to 21st century? What can you do with that? Anything. Everything. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I, I think that's probably the most important question. And obviously, as she start, started off with, it's a very hard question to answer. Uh, but I think the panelists did a great job at least getting that conversation started. Uh, next, I want to ask uh, Dr. Penlin a question. Uh, what are the different routes an aspiring teacher can take to earn teacher licensure in West Virginia? Are some routes more effective than other routes in preparing teachers for the classroom? Well, okay, so I'm going to jump back into the Shepherd Education, uh, now the School of Education. We've gone through some restructuring, if you've heard of anything, you know, in the news. Uh, the BOG has uh, encouraged us to give us recommendations what to do. Uh, alternative certifications, we have the TIR, which is a teacher and residence option. We now have piloted the year long uh, with four students, and we have significant positive feedback with these students. What they're sharing with me at midterm was, it's rewarding. I feel like I'm part of the staff on, on campus now. I feel like the students value my being present in the classroom. However, there's always a however, right? We're tired. Teachers are very tired. And I say, you see the reality. So we also have that option as well, the year long. We also have traditional. We also have the RBA for those students that cannot pursue it in the, in the traditional way. They come back and get a master's, okay? Uh, we also have internships, and I'm excited to have something just collaboratively solidified for 2020. Spring of 2020, we have the uh, NMOU with the USGS. And I see that the STEM fields in education are, are waning. They've been waning for the last 15, 20 years. We just solidified a clinical internship with that program. It's a federal program. It's wonderful. We also have other pieces to that uh, as far as the avenues that students can take. 
Uh, they can come in as a secondary level. They can come back and get endorsements. But it, the routes that I see are most difficult is the straight out taking uh, these assessments, which we put a lot of high stakes on. Um, Shepard has adopted the TPA, Ed TPA, and this is a national board certification high stakes assessment. Uh, we've had success. We've had piloted pro, uh, programs. We're also piloting virtual reality. As I mentioned last night, that wasn't addressed. We're also doing virtual uh, observations. And I never say anything to faculty that I'm not willing to do myself. That is the true leader. And I ask my dean to do an evaluation on me with my graduate class. She did, first time. I was the guinea pig. That's a new way that we're doing things, evaluating students in the field. Supervisors are doing this. I've had some resistance. The old guards see it differently. And uh, now I've seen some shift. And so I'm very, very pleased with this. So we were, we're doing more virtual observations, field, um, managing the budgets the best we can. But uh, here again, I'm going to go back to value the educator. Um, Pamela, anybody want to ask a question on that? Panelists, y'all, anybody else want to comment on teacher prep? All right, Dr. Lorenz. What are some examples of best practices in teacher preparation? Um, so talk about a couple things. Um, I talked a minute ago about expanding our board, our boundaries a little bit in terms of clinical um, experiences. And by clinical experiences, I mean full-time student teaching. Um, so I think one outcome of that um, is broadening our definition of diversity. But um, in terms of be best practices as well, it is supporting students in context where they might be place-based and not willing or wanting to go anywhere else. The other thing I'll say that we're doing in our elementary education program is we're shifting some of the courses. Instead of being a, for example, three-hour course on campus, we're gonna restructure it as a two-one. Two hours on campus and then one hour kind of lab style so that the faculty can go out and see or see via video um, the exact practice, practices and the connection between theory and practice in the schools and then come back to classroom in real time and talk about those pieces. And talking about that across our methods courses at the elementary level for science, social studies, mathematics, um, and uh, literacy. So that's an interesting model and I think it all comes down to also the rehearsal and practice of teaching, especially when you first do it. And on the other side of that, we need to be able and comfortable to receive and give really constructive data-driven feedback to our teachers. And, and how we model that also as what you do with feedback, it's not a criticism, it's a way to grow. So I think um, those things are really, really important. And using video and rehearsal and, and making those stronger connections to theory and practice is one way we're doing that at WVU. Um, another thing that I will say is that um, the co-teaching piece can be really powerful if it's supported really well. Um, co-teaching has been done for decades and decades, but what we have to think about, I think it's really, if it's done well, it's a wonderful marriage. Um, so I think another thing in best practices is using co-teaching, but not just saying go do it. Um, supporting it with resources, supporting it um, both in practicing schools and at higher ed, ed institutions um, in the facilitation and the outroll of that as well. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that the performance assessment is really, really valuable. That was um, put into policy a few years ago and it's really wonderful and best practice for folks to again video, reflect, look at their teaching, and use it to grow. Now, we haven't done the best job we can, I think, in our state with that induction idea as well. And so, like you were saying, it doesn't end at graduation, but these ideas of rehearsing teaching, looking at teaching, gating feedback, um, there are handfuls of counties in our state that do strong teacher induction, but there aren't enough. And if we're talking about recruitment and retention, if we want to keep our teachers in the field and in the state, all of those pieces have to come together. Just um, if, if we could see the uh, slide that I wanted to share earlier. Um, having to reshift and look at things, this is kind of uh, the image of where 
We're doing uh, year-long residencies, and this is where we're using some of our student teaching and the field placement. So go, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the spirit of 5100. Uh, I've had conversations with some of the administration about how do we give flexibility for our year-long programs and the best practices. What should we be doing uh, to allow this to be successful for our students? So I've looked at taking away one of the courses that I felt was a hindrance to our program uh, called educational technology, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, understanding that we should be embedding everything in our course seamlessly by the end of that, that student teaching experience they should be using all of this anyway without that course going, okay, now show me you know how to do this. So the next slide, please. I went through my program in the year and a half that I've been there and uh, shaking it up a little bit, but uh, looking at everything in our program, you see the technology overlap. That's everything except for educational technology. So do you think we, will, we would have an equivalent of three semester hours of technology by the time they get there? looking at the model. Do you think so? I don't know if you can see some of the words up there. You know, you're looking at technology, you know, knowledge, the content, the process, everything. So understanding that three credit hours uh, will be in flex and the best practices can be using technology ongoing and embedded in every single course. So it took me a while to glean this data and I have a spreadsheet as well. That satisfies that and for Kate, for the state of West Virginia, for certification and for our program to move forward, we're flexing three hours for the year long. And it's a big shift. It's a big shift, but it's difficult. And here again, I'm gonna reiterate, we need that support. We need the funding and the resources. Thank you. Um, I'll also add a few quick points. Uh, Going back to the routes in the profession, but also innovative practices, um, the gentleman last night from the community college mentioned the uh, effort to create articulation agreements with four-year institutions in the state. And that's a whole network of institutions. Uh, they're called two plus two programs that leverage the community college system to then bring new teachers into four-year colleges and complete their preparation. And that's another way to expand the pool of individuals entering preparation and also get them into the communities where it may be more challenging to recruit teachers that don't live near institutions of higher education. Um, in addition, the professional development schools that I mentioned are where you bring the work of preparation into K-12 schools. And those are innovative practices where suddenly schools become learning for not just the candidate, the student teacher, but also for the faculty at the institutions who get to learn from the practices of practicing teachers and for those practicing teachers who get to stay up to date on most recent research and for the principals. So there's a lot of that effort to bring preparation into schools. And I think that's really kind of the key to innovative practice as well. If I could just add to that, I just want to underline something that they've said, because when we talk about best practices, in terms of best practices, educational, educational preparation programs, teacher prep programs, are only in existence because of teachers in the school systems and because of our schools who need teachers. And so consequently, there has to be a close tie between those of us in higher ed and those of us who are in public schools. Because it, it's one of those things that has to work together. And as you were just saying, it has to go out into the schools. If it does go out into the schools, you have synergy. Because you have both the students that are growing into wonderful teachers and the good teachers that are growing into even better teachers. And it just becomes a, a, a perfect match for those. And that's why the clinical issue is so important. Because one of those pieces that's a best practices is getting students out into schools, students who think they want to be teachers, get them out there quickly to see what, they, what they're facing. Because if I'm a freshman and I think I want to be a teacher and I go into a school for three or four days, I may totally decide that that is absolutely the wrong thing for me and it saves me a lot of money and time, or I may decide that this really is my passion and so I can move forward. So that marriage between the public schools and higher education is critical. Uh, any questions from the audience on that? All right, the next one I think is one you'll be particularly interested in. Uh, Dr. Eagle, what steps can policymakers take in improving teacher preparation program evaluations? What policy levers do they have in changing teacher preparation program? 
it's obvious that I missed the planning meeting because I got the hardest question. <laughs> We've already talked about several of those things. Um, as I talked about the communication, just the fact that positive communication is incredibly important. I think one of the other issues that we need to think about is, you know, we, we've been through this major discussion for two or three years now or more on charter schools and what, what the benefits of charter schools are and giving waivers and being able to address things at a local level and so on and so forth. And I think the critical piece in all of that that we need to take back, whether it's a charter school or a regular public school or a parochial school or anything else, is that we need to have the flexibility to work with our students and to do what is necessary for our students. And if that means being able to do something a little bit different, then it may be an absolutely wonderful experiment that becomes something that we can share across the state. Um, we're joined by my colleague in the back, uh, Dr. Uh, Stan Maynard, who works with the June Harless Center, and a couple of things that they've been doing that does this very thing. One of those is our early STEM education. It's, an element, it's a uh, preschool situation in which we have at least two different groups, I think three now, maybe four, Stan, if he's still working back there, uh, that have basically created a perfect, not perfect, but close to it, situation for providing education for preschoolers and have replicated it across the state in several situations. That's what we need to be able to do. We need to have that flexibility to do that. If you've never had a chance to visit the Explorer Academy in um, Cabell County, I would encourage you to do that because what you'll see is you will see some things that are done just a little differently that have been tweaked a little bit that are, took a little bit of waivers and a little bit of experimenting and those sort of things, but an incredible atmosphere and an incredible results for the students that are coming from there. So I think allowing some flexibility for that, regardless of what kind of school setting we are, allowing that flexibility for us in higher ed as well because then when we can experiment with some of the things that we're doing, then we can see what's best. And talking about the um, year-long residency, we started out with four this year and had one drop out. And I wasn't too upset about that because I thought, well, this was something we sprung on these people. They didn't have a lot of preparation and a lot of time to think about it. So the fact that we only lost one was pretty good. But then we were looking at some others that were going, you know, this is just wearing me out. I'm trying to do this and do my finals and blah, blah, blah. So one of the things that we learned was that we had to plan ahead for those busy times so that the students wouldn't be discouraged and would have the time to do what needs to be done and to do it effectively. So just by being able to try that out and take that one little couple of weeks out of that session that they didn't participate in the school themselves, then they'll be able to go back and be fresh and be able to do it really well again. We didn't even think about that up front. Never occurred to us. But if you think about it, we should have been smart enough to think about it because when students get a break in public school, it's not the same time they get a break in higher ed. And so consequently, if you're doing something in public school and in higher ed, you don't get a break. <laughs> Makes lots of sense, but we didn't see it. So we have to be able to make those adjustments based on things that we learn along the way too. Really quick, um, my recommendation is that the triangulation up here, triangulation is the strongest structure known to man. And I think that we three up here have visited about how do we collaborate and create something, a synergy that is positive that can flow out into the public schools and connect. So that, that's my recommendation. One thing I'll say um, connects to our partner schools and mentoring, um, it's tough. We're having teacher shortages, and there's also re uh, requirements and policy that dictate we're not supposed to put somebody um, in a classroom in a clinical situation unless that uh, mentor teacher has at least five years of teaching experience um, and uh, goes through a mentoring uh, module and things like that. I am 100% sure that that policy was well intended. However, it creates barriers because just that number of five years does not a wonderful teacher make. Um, there are wonderful teachers out there that sometimes I would rather put one of my teacher candidates out there with a third year teacher than with a 10 year teacher. But according to policy, that's not what I should am allowed to do. So that's just one piece that creates a barrier sometimes. Um, and I think we just need to revisit it, especially in the context of our schools and what we're trying to organically grow. 
Um, I trust the teachers in schools. We need to trust the teachers in schools more um, to mentor our students. And in revisiting that qualification, um, I'm not saying throw them out there with anyone, but if we have data that supports that this is a great teacher, why do I have to wait until they've been teaching for five years? And I'll just add quickly, uh, working alongside the stakeholders across this state, um, to establish clear standards for the type of preparation you want and then ensuring that those standards are applied to every route into the profession is key. I think it's also really important going back to the question of mentors that the expectation, yeah, experience doesn't make you a good mentor. Good test scores don't make you a good mentor. There are training, there are skills you develop in working with novice teachers and that's something that we can invest in as a state is to ensure that all of those new mentors we're going to need to support new teachers are having those skills or learning those skills, and that's, that's a coordinated effort. Another key resource for mentors, national board certification. Again, that doesn't make you a perfect mentor, but you develop the skills to be an amazing teacher going through that process. And the research, very recent research, has demonstrated that nationally board certified teachers do have a really strong impact on new teacher induction and mentoring. So not only do you build the leadership and capacity of your existing teachers through national board certification, but you support the next generation through those policies. Oh, yeah, go, go, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Is there any tie between teachers that come out of private colleges and public education? What's the issue there? Can you, can you restate that question? If you have a teacher that's graduated from a private college, not, a, not, not one of your institutions, is there any tie between what you do for them and what, you, what is done for them by their institution? Or is, is the question like, is there a different preparation in private, edu or private high right. universities? Um, That's a very good question because it's often confused. But when we talk about teacher education, whether we're private or public, we are held to the same standards and held to the same accrediting body. So there really is no difference in terms of what the preparation is for the folks regardless. But do you all provide any, any of that, uh, that help for those folks that, uh, that graduate from the private college? If we're talking about things that happen once they're in the classroom, then absolutely, okay. because we don't we don't designate. Uh, it has to be someone who comes from a, a, a legitimate place. But the fact that they graduated from, I don't know, Alderson brought us or you know whatever, it doesn't make any difference. Wheeling. Yeah, yeah. Wheeling, maybe. We work with people all the time, and we also have people that come from bachelor's degrees in those institutions that come to us for master's degrees. So it's it's a common thread. I think we've got time for one more question. Thank you. This, this is a specific question for Dr. Lawrence. You mentioned this five-year obstacle on your mentorship. Do you know whether that is a, a statute or whether that's a state board policy? Because sometimes it's overlooked that the legislature has no oversight of the formulation of policies by the state board, but we do certainly enact numerous voluminous statutes but it help, would it be helpful to us to know one way or the other where that that source of uh, frustration exists um i'm going to look to my friend lisa over there to help me with that question um, but it's the state board policy it's a state, it's a state, state board policy yes so my question has more to do with um preparation of administrators because you all were talking about respect for teachers. And what I have seen is my children have gone through school and, and the, what has happened to teachers over time, extremely fine teachers retiring early because they are sick and tired of not having any backup. And not having the backup when you have an aggressive parent come in who thinks their child can do no wrong and deserves all A's when they have not earned it. I don't see the backup for a good teacher holding students accountable. Thus, we're getting one of the highest graduation rates 
while also having the highest remediation rate. So what does that degree stand for? So I think to get respect, you're going to have to create administrators who absolutely stand behind these good, innovative teachers that you are producing so that we have the young people decide to stay in the profession because we do have young people that understand they're not going to make a million dollars, but they really are going to touch a lot of lives and make the world a better place by creating ed an educated population. So to me, that is the one thing that I really see needs to happen to improve improve the profession, but also garner the respect that is deserved. And I, I love the fact that you brought up administration because that's my background. And when we talk about that preparation for administrators, what we really need, now I'm really on my soapbox, is what we really need is the same kind of thing that we do for teachers. So we need an, an externship or an internship where they can do that. Several years ago, we had a, um, a grant that allowed us to put our prospective principals in a position for, I think it was only eight weeks that we could afford. And we got incredible results in terms of what people found, how they responded and so forth. But that takes some kind of financial backing to be able to do that because you're paying for the substitute for that person while they're going along and following the administrator. I think if we were able to do that in a, in a more effective and more in a broader situation, we could do that very well. Because you're right, if you don't get the respect or the responsibilities from the person above you, you get tired and you no longer enforce it. And it goes also even a step higher, I would say, to superintendents. Because I think you're gonna find that same issue as you move up the ladder, as they've gotta have that support. So that's a really big, big issue and something that needs to be a concern. I'll just uh, respond really quickly. Uh, just recently, since of the uh, new policies that are in place, we have had the faculty senate and faculty have uh, attended these sessions in droves. You know how sometimes you go and we have these meetings after meetings after meetings. Um, the policies have pushed this to where the faculty are now pushing the administrators to, you know, put up, show me. You know, these contracts say professional development, uh, travel, presentations, this is part of your scholarship. If you don't have the funding, then don't expect the student, uh, the, the faculty to perform. And so uh, I have to uh, actually write many grants to go and do things such as Ireland uh, travel on teacher prep programs. But I am holding my administrators accountable. And I said, okay, looking at the contract, pull it out of their deliverables if you're not willing to, to provide. So yeah, you're right, I agree, thank you. I'll also say that I know the department has worked really hard to support principals in building their capacity to lead schools. Um, you know, teacher turnover is a really big challenge and one of the key factors is the quality of your administrator who leads your school. And so being able to support principals in collective decision making and instructional leadership are key ways to ensure that teachers have those supports in their classroom, they have that backing. And that also comes down to how we measure school quality. What are the metrics we're looking for to see in our schools? Is it a quality school culture? Is it work satisfaction for our teachers, satisfaction for our students and parents? And those are metrics we can learn a lot about how leaders are doing. And those are things where we can better understand exactly what they might need for support. All right, we're at 11 o'clock, but if there's any uh, last minute questions somebody wants to ask, we, we might better do that. I am a retired teacher with over 40 years. My teaching beginning started where we went through the four years of college training. And I know now as a teacher, you know your material. You also have to be a psychologist and you have to be a parent to students that aren't your children. And you also have to be able to listen. And one of the things that started out when I went into teaching, we had eight weeks of student teaching. Well, the thing you learn about student teaching at that time was that the classroom is not yours. So you think about how that is, and then when I got my first job, they took me down to my classroom and said, here's your classroom, 
go to it. Like, you don't even have water to swim in. But you know, the thing that you have to understand, students have a lot of problems, and teachers deal with all of those problems. I've had numerous times where students will tell me things that are going on that they will not tell their parents, would not even believe in telling their parents. And you have to be able to understand and work through those processes because you're a very, very, very important person, whether people believe it or not. And I always, always, always love to have parents come in and talk to me. Always. Never did refuse one. I had a lot of administrators that said, oh, no, 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 you don't want to bring them in. No, I want them. I want to talk to them. Because we have a thing that is good for both of us. Thank you. Thank you for teaching for 40 years. And Thank I'll, you, panel. I'll, can I say one last thing? You hit on something that I think is really critical to retention is our teachers experience secondhand trauma all the time and need support in that.